Hello and welcome to the Food Fight podcast. I'm Matt Eastland. And I'm Lakshmi Baldassan. And both Matt and I are from EIT Food, Europe's leading food innovation initiative, working to make the food system more sustainable, healthy and trusted. Over the course of the series, we're inviting guests from all areas of the food industry to talk to us about how we can tackle some of the world's biggest food challenges and fight for a better food future. Yeah, that's right. And on the podcast this week, we're dealing with trust issues. Uh, I'm not talking about my trust issues, but trust issues generally with food. So I think it's fair to say that our relationship with food has all got more complicated in recent years. So with the rise of clean eating movements, personal fitness, and just general awareness of the sustainability of our food, the world seems to be more engaged than ever with the idea of eating well. But with new brands, products and advice coming at us from all angles, who can we really trust to give us the right information and help us to make better food choices? So this is really interesting because nowadays we're constantly bombarded with health food fads that are popularized by celebrities who are really not even experts in this field. We have dubious Instagram nutritionists and dietitians. And in the product space, we have problems with things like greenwashing, where words such as organic and natural and sustainable distract us all from actual nutritional information. For instance, really, what is the fat and sugar content in some of our food? So ultimately, this podcast, we're looking at how can we trust the food we eat? So I think this is a good point to welcome our guests who are going to help us through the topic today. With us, we have Anthony Warner, otherwise known as the Angry Chef. Anthony is known for his dedication to exposing lies, pretensions and ridiculousness in the world of food. He's written two books, Angry Chef, Bad Science and the Truth About Healthy Eating and The Truth About Fat, Why Obesity is Not That Simple. Anthony's he's also been a chef in the industry for over 25 years. Hi, Anthony. Great to have you on the show. Hello. Yeah, good to be here. Excellent. And our second guest is Lisbeth Vranken, who joins us via the internet from Leuven in Belgium, where she is an associate professor at KU Leuven, which is a research university. And there, Lisbeth is involved in a number of EIT food projects, including one called Trust Tracker, which is monitoring consumer confidence in the food sector over time. And we're all really looking forward to hearing more about it. Lisbeth, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Nice to be here. So food trust. So let's start at the beginning and talk about the how and why you both got into this area. So Anthony, beginning with you, how did you become the angry chef? <laughs> I'm guessing it was because you weren't just throwing pots and pans around the kitchen? No, I, I, I do need to apologise for not being angry if people are expecting me to be shouting and screaming. Uh, but no, I, The Angry Chef is a character that I wrote. I created a blog in 2016. Which was really about, I, I was noticing a lot of stuff online, particularly on Instagram, with people talking about diet and nutrition, which for someone like me, and I'm a chef, I have a science background, um, I'm interested in nutrition, I'm interested in health, I'm interested in the ways we can make people eat healthier. So that's my area. So I was interested that there was lots of people online talking about this. And it's actually quite exciting, really. Um, but when I started looking into a lot of the claims that people were making, a lot of the things that people were saying about food, um, there was a lot of misinformation out there and a lot of return to some sort of misinformation which which i felt had been sort of successfully debugged several years ago was kind of returning in, in little enclaves on the internet and, and various celebrities and uh, sort of social media stars who are actually gaining quite a lot of traction and having quite a lot of influence but in a way you know because it's a new media and we're getting used to it it's a way that wasn't being didn't have any checks and balances they were directly communicating some often quite harmful and dangerous misinformation with the public. And I sort of felt there was a need for someone to be saying something about it. So I created this character, I created this blog and an online social media presence um, of just someone who was shouting and ranting about those sort of things. Um, and and yeah, it, for, for its sins, it became uh, reasonably popular because I think people were kind of a bit sick of being made to feel guilty about food, which mm. is essentially you know, one of our great pleasures. And you know, my, my the heart of everything I do is, you know, I love food. So I want to, I almost felt there was a need to protect food from people selling misinformation because it's very easy for people to sell stuff by making people afraid of something, making people afraid of what they're eating is a, is a good way to sell your product or sell your diet or sell your persona or sell your, you know, so, so I was kind of 
acting, I think, as food's protector, and it kind of caught on and became, you know, it became reasonably popular and led to a couple of books. And I actually just finished writing a third book, actually. So yeah, that's kind of where the persona came from. Oh, I'm looking forward to hearing more about this as we continue our discussions. And you, Elizabeth, same question. So why has food trust become a central part of your work, and why does it interest you specifically? Well, uh, in my research, I'm quite uh, concerned about the sustainability of our agri-food systems. And I think to move to more sustainable, more healthy agri-food systems, uh, we need the involvement of both producers, farmers, but also processors, retailers, but also consumers, actually, to try to steer them towards more sustainable, more healthy food patterns. Well, and a lot of the the food we are buying, they have some credence characteristics. We cannot easily assess whether a certain food product is sustainable or whether it's healthy, for example. So if we want consumers to steer towards more healthy uh, products, they need to have trust in the actors in the food system and they need to have confidence also that indeed the products that they are buying are indeed safe, that they are healthy as as, uh, what is claimed for. So therefore, uh, my interest in consumer trust originates from that fact that, okay, if you want to induce behavioral changes towards more sustainable food patterns, then, well, we need to change consumer behavior, and then this requires some trust in the fo- products they are uh, buying, actually. So, so that's really interesting. So you talk about consumer trust, but sort of looking at the food value chain, the food industry. So where, in your opinion, along that kind of food value chain from sort of farmer all the way through to consumer, where, where does trust start to fall down? Well, I think you can have trust in all different actors, actually. And I think um, we looked in a study particularly to the trust in farmers, in processors, in retailers, in authorities. On average, if I look to some of the figures, uh, we see that in most countries, so we did a study in several regions, that actually trust in farmers is typically highest, followed by trust in retailers, trust in authorities and in manufacturers. So it seems as if we have most trust in farmers uh, in, in the way they are producing our food, followed by retailers, authorities and manufacturers. Although I must say the differences are rather small. And Anton, I'm keen to get your opinion on this. So from a chef's perspective, you know, who who do you trust in the food industry? <laughs> is an interesting debate to be had. I have quite a lot of trust in the, in our modern food system and the way it's regulated. Um, I think just reacting to what you know that level of trust that people have, I think that has changed actually. Mm-hmm. I think if you went back, you know, when I was working as a chef in restaurants and hotels into the mid nineties towards the late nineties, certainly in this country, there wasn't that much trust placed in farmers. The farming system was constantly in the news for various scares and, you know, like BSE and salmonella and eggs and Mm -hmm. a lot of stuff happened around that time. And there was always a story on the front page of the paper saying, you know, farmers doing this. And and I think there was a lot of mistrust with farmers. And actually, if you went to manufacturers and brands, we kind of liked those big brands like Cadbury's of Nestle. And we kind of had a bit more trust in them. And I think that shifted over time. Mm. I mean, I don't have no empirical data to, to support that. But I feel that that's sort of been a real shift in that. And so that trust has changed perhaps because some of the practices of food industries have become called into into question as we've mm. had more problems with non-communicable diseases and the rise of obesity and type 2 diabetes over that time. I think that a lot of that's been pushed back into the manufacturers. Mm-hmm. Retailers seem to have got away quite lightly as far as I'm, as far as I'm concerned. Um, but um, trust fails when people people have a reason to mistrust things and people find out about practices that they're uncomfortable with. Hmm. Okay, so do we as consumers, do we need to worry about anything? And if we do need to worry about anything, what what is it? I think yeah, people have to eat three times a day and life would be so much better if we just didn't worry so much about the food we eat. I think, I think the actual act of worrying and the, the process of being anxious about everything we eat, I think is extremely harmful for us. Mm-hmm. People should just be able to relax about individual eating occasions, I think. And I try to encourage people to do that as much as possible. But, you know, wider sort of system things, yeah, we should we should be worrying and we should be holding the food system to account. OK. Uh, I do agree indeed. Uh, you say people shouldn't worry too much because I do agree that most of our foods are indeed safe. However, we see that consumers, they are not only concerned about food safety. We see more and more that people are also motivated towards healthy eating, but also towards sustainable living, for example. So I think this is also something where trust in your different food actors is rather important, actually. And, and do you think, Lisbeth, that, and I guess this is probably a question to Anthony as well, do you think that food producers, manufacturers are 
opening themselves up more? Do you think they're more transparent than they used to be? I mean, I agree. I mean, I've sat on a, a kind yes, of like a consumer yeah, panel yeah. and people have said, I don't understand what's going on. Mm. That's why I don't really trust it. So do you think that it's getting better? Well, I think yes and no, actually. On the one hand, I think manufacturers, retailers, they are realizing that actually consumers care more and more, not only about safety, but also healthiness, about sustainability on those aspects. So retailers, manufacturers start to realize that more and they really want to take that into account. I think, for example, if you look at France, Belgium, I think Germany is following now, they all introduced that Nutri scores, probably you you have Mm -hmm. heard about it, the ABCDE, color labeling of our food products, depending on the nutritional composition. This has been an initiative of retailers, they themselves, so it was not any any regulation that enforced them to do so. So this was free choice of them to introduce that into market. And I think this is really in response to have the feeling that consumers are asking. They they feel, okay, consumers care about it and we want to meet uh, their concerns and, and to make sure they can take nutritional quality into account and try to be more open and transparent. At the same time, what we see also is we have really a lot of information that is thrown at the consumer. At some mm. consumers, they just don't know it at the end. And I think this is a bit problematic because if you are you have so many labels going from different fair trade labels over organic labels, over bio-organic mm. labels, over reinforced lines, well, I think there are dozens, dozens of labels in the EU and that confuses us, of course. And I think this is a bit problematic because if you have so much information thrown at you at the end, you just stick with your regular choice. I mean, you don't this kind of choice deferral mm. you observe. So I think there, there's probably still some role to play to maybe get some basic messages out so that consumers are not, not too confused about all the labels. That yeah, I, I think them. that's um, an, an excellent point, actually. And Anthony, I wonder, you know, when we talk about overload of information and, you know, myths uh, in the food system, you know, a lot of what you do is about debunking those myths, mm. challenging pseudoscience. So in your opinion, what are the, the most scandalous stories of misinformation that you've seen and you're desperate to fight against? Well, I mean, there's various ones connected to health and diets, and I'm pretty much anti any sort of prescriptive diet, if I'm really honest. But I've seen several claim to cure various diseases, claim to cure cancer, claim to cure autism, claim to cure all sorts of things, some of which aren't... It's ridiculous, and you sort of laugh about it to an extent, but it's also extremely harmful, you know, Mm. especially for clinicians working in cancer care. You know, they've got patients coming in saying, I've gone on this very restrictive diet, and you know, which is incredibly harmful for someone's someone's treatment and recovery. Mm. So they're, they're the sort of most egregious ones. But I think there is a you know more of a a problem more generally with, with the food system. Generally, is, is again you know, echoing what has just been said about the, the amount of information people are being given, and and this idea that we constantly just need to give consumers more and more information to make them behave better. You know, the things that really undermine healthy eating undermine more sustainable dietary patterns they're not the aggregate of consumers choice it's systemic barriers to people doing certain things but but the kind of you know, food industry generally has this get out clause well we'll just give consumers loads of information and if they make the bad decisions and they do the thing that they're not supposed to be doing it's their fault and it's not ours and we'll hold our hands up and i think that's an, an inherent level of misinformation from the entire food industry that is just pushing the problem back onto consumers and blaming them rather than saying we need to fundamentally change the food system to make it more sustainable or we need to fundamentally change you know, society almost to make healthier eating choices. Well, people want ways to navigate the world in a simple, simple fashion, but often these things are very complex and it's very difficult to give people a single metric to say this is what you should be doing. And I think that trust experts is quite interesting because I feel like this whole movement as food, as medicine is quite interesting. Mm-hmm. For example, like where do these fads come from? Is turmeric the cure-all for every single <laughs> ailment under the sun? Um, well, no, no, it's definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I wouldn't, no, I don't want to go into that too deeply, but no, that's definitely true. And no food is, you know, no food's like going to 
cure you. I'm really anti the any idea that we should ever think food is medicine. I hate that because it's you know food's so much more than medicine. It's it's cultural and it's it mm. brings togetherness and it's pleasure and it's enjoyment and it should never be a penance and like something. Oh God, I've got to eat this kale smoothie, which is disgusting. You know why would you eat something that's you know unless you assign it some sort of magical qualities, which it just doesn't have. You know a lot of it does come from that mistrust of the pharmaceutical industry, mistrust of modern medicine. I mean, mistrusting modern medicine, I would just go back. 200 years and say, you know, would you want modern medicine as we have it? People would say, of course, of course we do. Um, but there is this mistrust in it because I guess we lead these sort of easy, sanitised lives and it's very easy to play on people's fears when they don't have a lot of time to think about these things. Um, you see it in politics, you see make America great again or take my country back or, you know, it's always like appealing to this past time when things were great. And that's a very easy thing to do. It's a cognitive trap that we're very inclined to fall into. And part of that is saying, yeah, so here's this traditional recipe from ancient wherever that people have used for centuries. And you think, well, people weren't that healthy <laughs> centuries ago. Mm. Um, and, and I think part of it is if you're a small person on the internet selling a diet, you can't create a medicine so you have to go for something where the regulation isn't <laughs> isn't isn't quite the same. You can't yeah. you can't get licensed for a new medicine, but you can sell someone a food product and insinuate that maybe it's good for a certain thing, or you can get a supplement or something. So it's never going to happen. But I would make me really happy if we couldn't make any health claims connected to food at all. Mm. Oh, I would back you on that. <laughs> but uh, I think okay, I fully agree uh, that that no one one single food item can have the same influence as a medicine or anything. But um, I do think, okay, of course, food patterns can be more healthy or not. And mm, I think this yeah. is something we should maybe stress towards many consumers. It's not that one candy or that one product with a bit more meat or fat, for example, that makes a difference. But it, you have to look at the whole pattern. That can make a difference. There are a lot of studies that certain diets, for example, a more Mediterranean diet or a more um, vegetarian diet, that this is typically associated with less diseases or risk for certain diseases. I, I think for me, it, it, it becomes down to the fact that there's, you know, like you say, there's too much information. It's all very confusing. I mean, Elizabeth, I mean, is this why you're you're trying to, this trust tracker project you're working on, is, it, is this why you're trying to do this? Because you're trying to sort of provide evidence to this? Well, I think that there's more and more attention in consumer trust from different angles, actually, yeah, from different actors in the food chain. On the one hand, this can be from certain processors, for example, they are interested and like, OK, if they bring you food on the market, if these are food products with credence characteristics, I will consumers trust it? Will they buy it? Um, with link to certain food scandals and this might have led to lower levels of trust. But also if you want to induce uh, behavioral shifts in consumer behavior, then it's needed that consumers trust the information that is provided to them. It's, it's, uh, so that to, to get insights on what forms trust, how is trust formated, what affects trust. So this is the reasons why we start looking into this in, in monitoring and measuring trust. Okay. And you're obviously looking across that kind of whole chain, you know, from mm -hmm. farmer to, to consumer. So I guess the question, you know, because you, you, you're both sort of saying that it, when it gets to the consumer side, it's all very difficult. So that whole trust piece, should it just be taken care of by the time it gets to the consumer? You know, Anthony, do you, do you think that's ever possible where consumers just don't have to worry about it? <laughs> no, I, mean, I, I think... There will always be money to be made, making people feel afraid. And, you know, the food industry does its fair share of that in trying to sell people. By implication, this is a healthier version implies, well, what you're eating is rubbish. So, you know, mm. you can't you can't sell people. Um, it's very difficult to sell people benefit without denigrating what they're doing now. So I, I think that's a very difficult thing to fight. You know, trust is, is an interesting thing. You know, I don't believe you can or should even expect to be able to make someone trust you because that's not really in your control. What you have to do is act in a trustworthy fashion mm -hmm. and be open and communicate and, you know, sort of show people what you're doing. Act in a trustworthy way, which the food industry doesn't always do. You know, let's let's be honest, there are examples of bad we have a great food system which is incredibly safe, but there are examples of bad practice. Um and then that needs and the food industry itself needs to call that to account and, and, and make sure people know about that when that happens. Mm. So that leads well into some questions we've had from social media. So the first question is, how do I know if claims made by food brands are genuine or a marketing ploy? 
Is there a <laughs> quick... <laughs> They're always a market employee. Um, <laughs> they might be genuine and a market employee, I suppose. Um, how do you know? I mean, I, I think... Certainly for big food brands, you know, obviously there's very strict regulations about what they can and can't say. And I'd like to think that most of them do comply with that. There's a few that don't, including some of the big companies. You know, I, I'm especially keen to call them out when they say that a product will detox you or a product will, mm. you know, alkalize your body or something like that. Yeah, we can we can have a certain amount. They're key of, words, uh, like detox is a good one. Well, I mean, like I said, I, I mean, personally, I think any sort of health claims, I think I would just remove all health claims from food, and that's not going to happen, I know. But, I mean, a lot of them are, you know, sort of evidence-based, but still a bit I, I, I'm very suspicious of. You know, like the people will make a, a small pot of dairy drink, for instance, and make a health claim connected to that small pot of dairy drink. But the health, and not kind of explained to consumers, but the actual health claim is due to the fact that they fortify that with vitamin, which they can make that health claim on. I personally think that sort of thing is disingenuous. So I would encourage everybody whatever the claims are, not to idolise certain foods. Yes, dietary patterns are incredibly important. Mm -hmm. So... Yes, I mean, you can be fairly certain there's good evidence behind any claim on a major brand in a major supermarket. Health food shops, totally different world. I walk around them and I, I think with people I know who work in legislation and they're just like, oh my God, why are they saying all this stuff? Um, which I le just legally shouldn't be allowed to say. I would just ignore them anyway. <laughs> and Lisbeth, I mean, Anthony mentioned uh, health food shops and you know some of the guidelines. Um, do you think, from your research, that these guidelines and labels and you know all of that are they strict enough? These guidelines. I think so. It's very hard to put certain regulation on some of those things. Eh? I mean, the claims are also so diverse. I think it's more important that, for example, like what they promise that it is in there, that the content is really what it is. I think there's mm. a role for the government. You had some scandals about uh, certain, uh, it, it's with some choco pasta or with honey or whatever, that they added sugar to it, for example, to honey, which is not the case. So I think there's an important role, I think, for the government to control those things. Certain claims are also very hard to verify, so it's also hard to prove that they are wrong, for example. So mm. then it becomes difficult to make strict regulation on it. But I think it's more important to have good regulations and that uh, the product indeed contains the content that the producer is, is uh, indicated on the on the label. Mm. And Anthony, do, do you agree? I mean, is I, it I think, strict I, enough? I think the regulations are probably strict. Oh, yeah, probably a few things I might change, but the regulations are probably strict enough. They're just not enforced, especially on um, social media advertising. You know, I mean, the advertising standards do a, in in this country do a reasonable job of trying to pick that stuff up. But you know, some of the stuff that's being advertised and some of the claims being made for food online from big, you know, social media influencers. You know, it's it's horrendous. Do you have any examples of what what's really uh, <laughs> what's name, really upset you? Do you want, do you want yeah. to name names? No, I mean, no, the, well. the, the, you know, the, the the various okay, so the various sort of Kardashian endorsed slimming products. Mm -hmm. Let's say, um, you know, I think the claims being made on them are horrendous, and they're not evidence based, and those sort of claims should not be allowed. Um, I mean, I can think of a number of products which would sell themselves as detox products. Mm. As I said, you know, there, there's various teas from major brands who are owned by very big companies, sold in big supermarkets, weight loss teas as well, you know, which are basically just laxatives. Um, so nice, yeah, mm -hmm. um, which I guess in huge quantities will make you lose weight, but not in a healthy or sustainable way. But yeah, I mean, there, there, I do feel that there are quite good regulations in place regarding health claims but i will walk around these sort of exhibitions and where you've got sort of health food brands startups you know with their products displayed making these grand claims for you know various health conditions they can treat and i say y you do know you can't actually mm. legally say that on pack and they're like what but it does i read it on a on a website that it can the term it can cure information you know and <laughs> you, you can't say that you know and, but people still will because there's so many of these little brands and so many of these little companies that, that the regulators Regulations exist, but they're not enforced to a huge amount. And you only have to walk around any health food shop, including the big high street ones. And you can, I could find a hundred claims which shouldn't be allowed. And just picking up on your social media thing, I find that really interesting because that's a huge influence now. It's mm. a good way to sell product. And I know recently there's been a campaign called I Weigh that mm. has really worked with Instagram and Facebook to actually no longer be able to advertise anything supplements to lose weight. 
So, you know, we talk about governments and the food industry, but actually, should the big social media giants now be responsible? I, I certainly should, should. Should social media giants be responsible? Discuss, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they certainly should um, in many ways. Should there be regulation? Um, I, think, I mean, there, some people picked up um, like in the news yesterday, actually, about for, for making, you know, claims about weight loss products and certainly advertising them in a way which was, um, you know, perhaps sort of dangerous to, to some of the consumers. In fact, that they're, they're people who clearly don't need to lose weight. It's why I started writing is that social media particularly is this mine of misinformation where you create these little little information bubbles which are extremely troubling you know if, let's be honest though we're losing the battle on vaccines food is probably down the list in some ways some of the health claims on food um so yes I, I don't quite know how that can be done but yes we need to call out social media i'm wondering then it will be very hard eh? like you have a lot of fake news on social media on a lot of topics and how to to limit it and how so then i sometimes wondering should there not be one simple clear message that is bringing by different governments on what a healthy diet is eat a lot of uh, variation a lot of fruits a lot of vegetables don't overdo any product but i mean and okay it's fine if you eat some meat but don't overdo it and things like that mm. isn't this something that is missing because we probably can never control all media, all social media, this is yeah. a big issue. I'm wondering sometimes whether that is maybe not a more realistic option to try to stress that more. Yeah, so um, to both of you, where can consumers go to get trusted information? I always say the best information is going to come from big reputable authorities. You know, in, in the, you know the UK, you'd look for health eating information from the NHS. You know, the, the yeah. uncontroversial things like that. But I think people don't even really understand well the difference between what a registered dietitian is a is a registered healthcare professional and nutritionist is. Yeah, well, I mean, there are qualified nutritionists, but also anyone can call themselves a nutritionist online and often mm. quoted in newspapers, a nutritionist said, but they don't really have any proper nutrition qualifications. Um, I mean, I, I go to the NHS, I go to the British Dietetic Association, you know, these sort of big institutions. I think one one of the problems, I mean, I think I probably agree. I don't think there's much, I, don't, I actually don't think there's much information people need about healthy eating. I think you can probably write it down on the back of a postcard what, what people should know, yes, you know, yeah. lots of fruit Absolutely. and vegetables. I'm going, to, I'm going to need that person. Not, not quite. You know, <laughs> don't overdo it on meat. You know, probably about it actually. You know, or some oily fish now and again. I, I, don't, I think, mm -hmm. I think we, we don't want to overload people with information, but you know, we should have consistency of information coming out. But I'm also slightly worried that sometimes. Uh, in the way a lot of media is disseminated, if there is a universal message from every single government and authority, people will say, ah, oh, yeah, that's a conspiracy. So you end up with all sorts of problematic things. I mean, the, the way to get around that, I suppose, is to have that message endorsed by people who people mm -hmm. inherently trust you know and there are there are some characters just get david atom to do it all and we'll all be fine <laughs> I, you know faceless government authorities telling you what the best way to eat is is never going to be a popular sell no and, and lisbeth i mean I, I think picking up from what anthony's saying there so based on what you're finding from your research and the trust tracker you know is is there anyone that could take on that role of like trusted information giver. I mean, you mentioned the farmers, but you know, can you ever see a time where it's just farmers on social media giving us the information we need about how to eat healthily? Is that going to happen? Uh, no, no. Um, I uh, no. I I think when I was uh, mentioning earlier, okay, if we look at the different actors, we have maybe most trusting farmers, but I'm, I don't think these are should be the ones uh, in social media promoting certain diets. I think there probably there is a much bigger role of some celebrities that people trust that indeed some celebrities, well known people are indeed bringing the message evidence based messages on what are healthy diets, but probably the message should come from different angles. Not only the mm. government, not only celebrities, not only scientists. No, from all of them. If 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 more people would bring that same message, and I personally, I think a lot of consumers are not very aware what a healthy diet is. Actually, we did mm. a very small test, a preliminary test, where we created an online shopping environment, and where we, on one hand, introduced some labels in that shopping environment and saw then what type of product and how the food baskets looked of those shoppers, but then in some 
some cases, we had as a treatment also where we just brought a very simple message, a very simple as uh, saying, uh, you're expected to, I don't know by heart, to eat 400 grams of fruit and vegetables per day. Uh, I think it was 100 grams of meat. Uh, and if it's red meat, only 60 grams per mm -hmm. meat. That simple message, very simple message, had actually most impact on the composition That's of the, the food basket. So on the one hand, I thought, okay, this is good news. If this and this... Uh, but at the same time, I was a bit like, oh, my God, this also means that consumers are not still not yet fully aware of what a healthy meal looks like or a, a healthy diet looks like. So these small, maybe we should play, a, um, try to put some emphasis on, on those aspects, things that are evidence uh, based, that are supported widely by scientists to promote those things. I think it's a very good point that you, know, you need people influencing in many many different ways you can't just say the, the reason what we're going to do is run a massive television campaign with lots of adverts you know you need people at almost every level disseminating information and talking about things in a sensible way you know so i write a blog and some books and occasionally write for newspapers so i do my sort of thing which that yeah. speaks to my audience, but I certainly won't reach everybody doing that. I won't. I only reach a very small number of people, but I'd encourage people to be making videos. I'd encourage people to be communicating on various different social media channels. I'd encourage people to be, you know, writing if that's what they do, or, or, or creating different sorts of content, which is going to appeal to different groups of people and get good information out there. And and just for you know, as to inspire a huge number of people to be really, really, really passionate. I, I think, generally speaking. One of the most important things we can do, and it doesn't just apply to food, um, but you know that's what I'm interested in, is perhaps sort of change the way we we educate about science. You know, because mm. when I when I went to school, probably when everyone goes to school now, certainly for, for quite a long time, you're just taught that science is a list of facts, mm. whereas actually science is a, is a method of critically appraising um, information and, and, and doing designing experiments and testing and, and, and just being very critical and doubting what you hear and looking for evidence. And it's you know a way of getting closer to the truth. And I think if we taught that from schools, you, you would just create a, a world where people were more critical of the information they were given and looked for, you know, rather than just sort of re taking everything you read as, 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 as face value or thinking because something's high up in a Google search is more likely to be true. You know, people mm. would actually look at things and critically appraise them. And I think if we can create a world where that is more the case, you will have a better chance of people actually critically appraising things for themselves. And Lisbeth, do you agree with that? Yes, I tend to agree indeed that, that we should educate our consumers to be critical indeed and learn to not to believe anything um, blindlessly. I mean, mm. they, they uh, should be critical themselves. But I think it, it will be a combination of things. On the one hand, we, we need to learn them to be critical. At the same time, we also know that a lot of food decisions are actually taken very unconsciously often we don't think about it we take the products that we know that are most uh, easy available and things like that and also there i think schools governments can play a role as well mm -hmm. because this might be the location where they try to get in contact with certain foods so and where they get acquainted with them and make it and try to create their habit of eating this type of healthy foods OK, I love that. So, um, guys, I mean, we're, we're both nearly out of time. But before you go, I wanted to ask you, we tend to ask, I guess, this question because it gives some interesting responses. <laughs> if you could rip up the food industry and start again, I mean, we're literally talking control, alt, delete here. Mm. How would you redesign the food industry to build in the right level of trust and transparency from the ground up, from the start? Ooh, I mean, that's a very difficult question. I, I think the most fundamental things that need to change about the food industry are the fact that for certain sorts of foods, um, it, it, it's far more um, profitable to grow and sell. Mm -hmm. um, and they're the ones that sort of the marketing muscle tends to get put behind. So I think you, you sort of fundamentally need to restructure the way we farm and the way we subsidise agriculture particularly, you know, I, I would really look about the, the one lever I believe that make a massive difference to our food system is, is repurposing a lot of the subsidies in agriculture mm -hmm. to, to get behind things which are more sustainable, to, to get to a place where food is produced in a better way. Amazing. And what about you, Lisbeth? How would you change the industry from the beginning? What might also help if you have with all the technologies we have now to to increase transparency and openness. I think if consumers uh, 
even if they wouldn't do it, eh? but just the fact that they have the ability to check where their food comes from and what path it has followed, that eh? from farm to fork, for example, I think that would also already help, like just providing them that information. Now it often remains a bit of a black box to them. And even if eh, you could think of having some information, QR codes, for example, that you could scan, even if they wouldn't check on it every time they buy the food because people won't do it. But the fact that it might be there might also already, I think, create some or increase trust in the actors. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks. Um, We're ready to wrap up. So if you can both tell us a little bit more about where people can find out more about your work. Anthony? Yes, you can buy my books. And also I have a a website and a blog, which is um, angry-chef.com, I think. And you can follow me on Twitter, where I do quite a lot, and on Facebook if you want. What's your Twitter handle? Um, One underscore angry (laughs) underscore chef. Brilliant. What about you, Elizabeth? Where can people find more information about your work? Well, I must say I'm not that active in social media. I have a Twitter account, but I'm not using that that frequently. And for the rest, I think most can be found on the website of the university, actually, where uh, if you would Google my name, you end up on the university website where they find information on on my uh, research as well as some publications and presentations that I've given. And what about the trust tracker? Um, I think for that, uh, I would redirect them to the website of IIT Food. Great. So there should be a link over okay, there. Okay, back so. to the evidence and good science. <laughs> yeah, I love that. So, uh, guys, it's just uh, up to up to me to say thank you both so very much for your time. Another fascinating podcast, this one talking about trust. Um, so thank you and uh, goodbye for next time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.